<laughs> well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the pre-Thanksgiving bull sessions. My name is Mark Robertson. I'm joined here by Ken Kavula. Good afternoon, Ken. Good afternoon, Mark. Good afternoon, everybody else. Uh, I'm tickled by Dennis's comment here. Mark, he says, on the learning experience side, I just want to go on record and say I already learned how to lose money. It's the <laughs> other side he's interested in today, okay? So let's focus on not how to lose money. Let's focus on the other side today, he says, all right? Okay, well, that's that's what we're generally focused in on. We ever, we ever once in a while stumble into the other learning experience land and... Um, <laughs> And I've I've actually want all more on that later, and we're joined here by Kim. Kim is able to join us for at least a few minutes this afternoon, I believe. Are you still out there, Kim? I am. How's everybody doing today? Doing good. You got got your uh, dinner all planned and everything for Thanksgiving? Uh, turkey breast, uh, Brussels sprouts with bacon, and uh, brown sugar. Uh, as well as we're going to have mashed potatoes and gravy and probably Dutch apple pie. Whoa. Sounds good. I'm going to, I'm going to have to somehow find something to conspire with to uh, take care of the two of us here in a few days. Anyhow. Well, happy Thanksgiving to all of you. It's been uh, a pretty good year considering it's, it's been, I, I don't know. I've been investing like this for 30 some years now. It's uh, and Ken, uh, you've got a couple years on that. It's been one of the more unusual one or two year combinations that I can remember. Well, you're absolutely right, Mark. There's uh, there's I don't have anything to compare the last two years to in my entire experience. That uh, I mean, I got a couple of comparisons with the downturn in 2019, but nothing to compare with the rebound at this point. Yeah, it's it's kind of bizarre, you know. We had so many things work out so well for us last year. Pretty good this year again, but it's like a, it's just kind of weird and uh, uh, kind of being the lockdown phase of it all and everything. It's 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 different, but uh, I do believe there's still a considerable amount to be grateful for, and including uh, friends and family. So we will do that. Um, we are going to spend a little bit of time here kind of reminiscing or if anything triggers, you guys are welcome to chime in. Definitely are thankful for investors who have shown us things in the last year or year or two. Um, and Kathy Wood certainly qualifies. And then I don't know if you'd ever seen that Barron's cover before, Ken, but I remember when that came out, I actually had that laying on my credenza for months. Uh, Amazon.bomb. Um Quite, quite an interesting assault on Amazon back in 1999. And uh, we'll take a little bit closer look at that as we go. Yeah, I used to get Barron's, but I don't remember this cover, so I must have stopped the subscription before uh, this cover came out. I can just remember being struck by the tenacity of the assault on uh, Bezos, and it was something else at the time. But we'll come back to that here in a few minutes. Let's go ahead and get the legal paperwork out of the way here. I see a lot of very familiar names. You guys all know this drill, but if you are joining us for the first time, uh, extra big help, uh, uh, welcome to you. But no investment recommendation is intended whatsoever. This is an educational demonstration. We are here to chat and discuss and explore the methods, philosophies, and techniques of the modern investment club movement. Everything that we do here is a demonstration or an illustration, an exploration, uh, moments of sharing, all that kind of stuff. We are sharing opinions. Um, please do not act and just simply dial up your broker and call, do your own homework, and uh, just please do your own homework. Uh, we will try to remember to disclose if we hold the companies in our own portfolios that we are discussing. We are a week away from the round table next Tuesday evening at uh, 8.30. I did get an RSVP from Hugh Ken, so Hugh McManus should be joining us. Fantastic. Um, pretty good track record, 18 and a half, maybe 19% rate of return since July 2010. So we try to share some ideas and share the analysis of those ideas, and they've worked out pretty well. Um, I've been a little bit chilly, and that's putting a real thick 
sugar coating on it for the last <laughs> year or so. But, uh, can can well, you don't have to tell us? Well, no, it's it's pretty noticeable if you if you actually look back at what I picked and what happened, and we do that every February, by the way. But uh, Cy Lynch, you want to talk about things to be thankful for on the round table? He is absolutely, he's not on fire. He is molten lava. Um, Between his selections of Schwab and Axos Financial and uh, EPAM Systems, just completely off the charts. We're going to have to towel him off come February when we do our awards program. Um, Well, I'm going to share Schwab with him, Mark. Uh... I, I was the first one to bring Schwab to the portfolio, but Cy doubled down on it a couple times, so I'm real glad about that. Yeah, you guys are both uh, you guys are both rocking it pretty good, and every, we're all doing okay. Um, my extremely lousy selections are offset by some good ones, so uh, I don't feel too bad about that. But if you want to attend those sessions, and if you'd like to be reminded about them, Send an email to nkavula1 at comcast.net. Again, it's a monthly program that we do on the last, generally the last Tuesday of every month at 8.30 Eastern time. And uh, we just have a lot of fun doing it. If you have any follow-up to today's session, suggestions for future topics or anything like that, you, our two email addresses are right there at the bottom of the slide. All right. Well, what's on your mind today, Ken? Well, I'm uh, I, I have my portfolios rebalanced, Mark. I've I've done a lot of uh, pondering of my dashboards and uh, wondering what I can do to improve the par values of those dashboards, and uh, got my tax selling out of the way for the most part. So I'm just kind of sitting tight now until the first of the year to see where where the market heads next. Uh, um, well, I, I'm, I'm I'm not getting I'm not getting super upset about any direction that the market happens to take in the next six weeks. I I think this is usually a pretty good time of year, but that doesn't guarantee anything. So, yeah, and you know I think we're going to talk about it here in a few minutes. But this tsunami of opportunity, I'm not so sure it's not January effect on steroids where. You have the those bolstering companies in the NASDAQ that are holding up the the overall average, but a whole bunch of companies that are just taking an absolute plummet. And uh, I just wonder if there aren't some opportunities in there. We want to talk about that. That's what I mean by this tsunami. I'm going to spend a moment with Insider Monkey here today. People, uh, Several people have written and asked about it, and Kim has suggested we uh, point people to that a little bit. And then we will talk about Data Roma next uh either next week or the week after. And we are giving up on inflation jitters, but I have to apologize to the audience. I just, I uh, attempted to uh, tackle the bibliography of stuff and we've had some things going around here around the house and I just haven't been able to spend any time on it. So I I want to dig in a little deeper and treat that with uh, the care that it deserves. But we will spend a little bit of time on those other subjects that are shown there. Again, you're invited to suggest a way we are... uh, Looking forward to whittling this list down and covering the subjects that you guys want us to cover. Anything else that you want to add to that, Kim or Ken? No, I, I'm i ready to get started. I like your deck today, Mark, so let's take a look at it. All right, I thought I'd get the groundhog out of the way because we can, even though we are having a little bit of a rough year for the groundhog, we don't get too hung up on the the results of any one year. That's really, really important when we're reviewing any of my portfolios right now. Um, you don't get hung up on one year. You look at, you know, 10 or 15 year track record, but these are the one year results, uh, actually 10 month results. We've got about two months to go as the clock ticks down on this. It's a contest, stock picking contest. We run from Groundhog Day to Groundhog Day. And uh, you can see that Ken's got a pretty uh, big presence there. I don't know if you had noticed Ken, but B.I. Baker has edged just barely ahead of mid-Michigan. I noticed uh huh they both have uh portfolios, but there's not an ov- a lot of overlap between any of these club portfolios that I put into the contest they're They're pretty unique portfolios, all of them uh I did make sure that uh the club portfolios that I put in uh were stocks that the clubs actually owned, 
uh, it's a subset of their total portfolio. So uh, we'll we'll see how it does. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing my dot on the dot plot move up. It's kind of like going to a Fed meeting every couple of months, Mark. I'm <laughs> waiting for waiting for February to see my dot take a little bit of of a journey upward on the graph there with uh, with my performance so far. I'm knocking on all kinds of wood because I haven't been this high in a in a groundhog contest in years. So uh, even a blind squirrel catches a a nut sometimes. Yeah, this so. this this won't hurt your long term performance at all either. Nope, nope. It's been strong. No, good stuff from top to bottom here. One of the things that we'll probably do as Groundhog Day approaches is is take a look at any conclusions we might draw from, you know, how some of these people have picked portfolios. In the past, we have looked at things like the broad assets and their launch pad investing uh, type concept. I'd also like to take a look at can we draw any conclusions between does it make sense to pick five stocks or 20 stocks, you know, what does that look like on a distribution? Uh, we have talked about that briefly, but uh, we might check in on it again and see if there's anything that we can, any conclusions that we can draw, and then perhaps even a little uh, look at style. I mean, one of the individuals that's not on this list, uh, other than me, would be Hugh McManus, who has won this contest twice, but he's pretty much at the bottom of this year's list. And, uh, I think that kind of speaks to even Kathy Wood on the right there. I mean, we're not we're not talking anything nefarious or bad about Kathy Wood. She has one heck of a track record with ARK investing, but it's I will tell you that to me what we see happening with Kathy is just uh, this tre tremendous powerful reminder that sometimes things just don't go very well for some for a period of time, an undisclosed period of time. And uh She's definitely had quite a rough year, despite having a huge concentration in Tesla. And a lot of people are, are wondering, well, how in the world could you do that? Well, uh, it can be done. So she is it, down there. It's interesting to dig in these contests and looking for counterintuitive facts, Mark. Uh, uh, here's a fact I found from our stock pickers contest, the one we run in mid-Michigan. We do allow those uh, portfolios to trade uh, three different times during the year and to trade uh, out one stock and, and replace it with another, sort of like we're doing on the uh, small company uh, portfolio. Only mm -hmm. We have set dates when that can happen. We don't allow it to happen at any time. And in the last 10 years, uh, and that's as far back as I went was 10 years, uh, we don't have a single winner or not a single second place club that did any trading during the year. So uh, I, I, it's, it's, it's what it's worth. It's a small sample. The contest usually only has 30 to 40 entries in it. Uh, but it, it seems like the portfolios that are just kind of left alone for a year uh, tend to move to the top of the list. Uh, uh, I sometimes wonder if if people don't get uh, the heebie-jeebies at the wrong time and and go after stocks that are are hot topics in the news, but not necessarily hot topics in the analysis when you take the time to take a look at it. That that brings silence to mind again. Uh, I can remember a couple of years ago uh, n not being negatively critical of you know a stock that. He had picked for the round table and his response at the time, I'll, I'll never forget was, has the clock run out yet? I'm like, what clock? He says, exactly. There isn't a clock here. Sometimes these things just take time. And, and then he proceeded to very diplomatically tell me to chill. And uh, I don't remember the exact company. I'll go back and figure this out because it's a great story. And, you know, next thing you know, it's it, everything is just fine, but it did take some time. Well, it well, that, well that, that's also what I recall is I always recognize that I could have a great stock. It could have great financials, great management, but the market is a voting machine and the market itself may have not recognized that great quality stock. Absolutely. And the, and the, and the price is, you're going, when? When will this move? Yeah, I, I like actually. Like I said, just gotta be patient. 
Yeah, and right now we're seeing a number of examples of companies like Best, Best Buy beating results by 10%, and the stock price dropped 10%. You know, here in the last couple of days. So, I mean, that's got to be really frustrating to a, a newcomer. And, uh, you know, if you're relatively new to investing, sometimes there's no logical explanation for this stuff. And uh, patience, there, there it is, Ken, the word patience and discipline is required. Absolutely. All right. So let's keep rolling here. Well, again, keeping this in perspective, I think it's so important because everybody's starting to dump, uh, dump all kinds of foul stuff on Kathy and she is having a rough year um, her fund is not keeping up with other funds but she's still in first place when you look at the long-term performance the way that we do comparing performance versus the market that's what we mean by relative return the, the column on the far right the relative return is the answer to the question how much did these uh, 10 institutional funds beat the market by over the period shown and since uh, 2014, ARK Innovation, Kathy Wood's kind of flagship fund, has turned in a performance of 29.3% during a time uh, while the market has done 15, 14 and a half, and that's where you get this, this return. Now, that lead used to be really flashy. I, I believe it was over 20% approximately a year ago. So the lead over uh, number two and number three has actually narrowed to where we could see a change at the top of the leaderboard if uh, things don't turn. But again, keeping this long-term perspective is important. I still consider all of these funds to be uh, quite legitimate sources of ideas for, for companies to invest in. Uh, Ken and I found a number of companies as we updated the, the holdings of these uh, mutual funds and exchange traded funds for the best small company stuff. So just something to keep in mind. I've highlighted the Motley Fool 100, one, because uh, we're thankful for the Motley Fool. Second, uh, they do tend to invest like we do, and amongst these 10 options, these they do have the highest quality collection with a fairly decent return. So we'll take a look closer look at that. But uh, again, I, I think Kathy Wood is uh, experiencing a year like I've had, um, some some really laggard performance in some of the selections. And it, it just happens. It happens from time to time, and you just have to kind of shake it off. I think uh, we also have to recognize that as being stock pickers, sometimes life interferes. And you're picking the stocks, you're following the stock, but life interferes that you can't do your regular due diligence, and that can affect your outcomes. Absolutely. Your thought, Ken? Lynn is making a really good point uh, in the uh, uh, comment box, Mark, that that one of the, the issues with ARC right now is uh, uh, she's been forced to do liquidation uh, because people are, are uh, selling her fund and putting their money somewhere else because the performance hasn't been as spectacular as it had been in the past. And that's something that we don't have to deal with. We don't have... Well, I, I won't say we don't have to because there are times when your portfolio needs forced liquidation. If you're putting a child through college or if you're buying a house or something like that. But for the most part, we don't have any forced liquidation going on uh, on a year to year basis. And so that's another kind of a, a hurdle that some of these managers have to overcome in, in times when the outflow is more than the inflow of cash coming in. Mark, we also have a question on the parentheses uh, on the names. I'm assuming those are uh, where they stood, what, a year ago? Is that right? No, uh, a month ago. Last month. A month ago, last month. Okay. Yeah, and they move around a little bit, but not too much. The company's up at the top. And the asterisk would mean that they weren't on the list a month ago then, right? Right. That first trust, clean edge energy, if you're... If you want to be a green investor, uh, that is a, a plentiful uh, pot to go searching, and you can actually search for the holdings on QCLN, or you, you can own it directly, obviously. Um, okay. Good place to go. All right, so let's keep looking around. Just to make a point here, uh, this is the Motley Fool 100, hence the TMFC, Motley, the Motley Fool 100. 
TMFC is the ticker for this exchange traded fund. Again, I don't work for the Motley Fool. They don't pay me anything to mention them. I just mention them because uh, from top to bottom, it tends to be a, a portfolio that uh, resonates with us. I, you know, they eat the same thing for breakfast that we do. And uh, I own a number of these companies. Um, how about you, Ken? As do I. I'm just counting down the list. I own 11 or 12 of them, Mark. Uh, this represents what about uh, 50, about 40 or 50 percent of the whole portfolio. The the top 20 here. Oh, it's it's probably more. It's probably closer to 60 by the time you add it up down to. Okay. Because you get top the, 25, maybe you get this to 40 percent yeah. in the top four. Of so course it, you do. Okay, it's, yeah. So, it's uh, pretty yeah. close. It's pretty close to uh, the type of thing you see with a market cap weighted Nasdaq fund or some of those type of things. And uh, a number of these are uh, pretty good studies right now also. Kim, are you, uh, have you dialed in on PayPal again yet? Oh, I've been dialed in. I'm just watching to wait to see where it uh, hits its bottom and then it starts moving up before I would get in, add more. Yeah, a number of these companies are in the Manifest Top 40, which is the most widely followed companies at Manifest. So we, uh, follow many of these closely. Now, some of you may remember from the stock panel at the Successful Investing 4 conference a couple of weeks ago, I picked Visa, just in time for Visa to have a, an announcement about Amazon dumping them and doing some stuff. We, could, and, we couldn't guess something like that was going to happen when you picked it, Mark. Well, Come on. I, I, I actually have, I have emails. I have emails that document. <laughs> Well, and I just want to let the both of you know, I, I believe that uh, Visa may have had some bad news with Amazon, but I believe that PayPal had some good news with Amazon. Yeah, there's there's all kinds of stuff happening. I'm not worried about Visa, but uh, it's it's just you talk about Murphy's Law coming back to nip you um, and it, it, it just never fails. But I'm yeah, still what's, thankful. What's interesting to me, Mark, is I manage three personal portfolios, an IRA for myself, one for my wife, and then a uh, on the other side of the tax curtain, uh, a portfolio that uh, is managed with, you know, uh, without worrying about uh, uh, or, or with worrying about taxes, uh, that kind of thing. But Microsoft is the largest holding in one, Apple's the largest holding in another, and Alphabet's the largest holding in in the third portfolio. Mm -hmm. So it's it's interesting that that uh, you know if you if you listened to people and uh, weren't afraid of some of these gigantic companies, uh, you you really needed some of your money there if you were going to perform in the last couple of years. Yeah, and Microsoft, of course, is the dominant position in the tin, uh, excuse me, roundtable portfolio now. Good stuff. Well, speaking of dominant companies, and a few years ago, I, I still get a kick out of this one. I'm not sure how this one percolated to the top. It may have been a, a column by uh, Jason Zweig at, Zweig at the journal, but uh, um, as I was telling Ken before we got started here, I can remember actually having this on my desk for months if not weeks um back in that time frame right around the turn of the century when we were worried about y2k and the thing that uh one of the reasons that i had is i was struck by the tenacity and the the almost attack on the situation and the the absolutism of the criticism here to call uh, amazon even at the time uh, certainly not understandable for many incomprehensible but to call it silly and not a new paradigm and, and and i mean the that paragraph on the left i haven't actually gone back and looked to see who actually wrote the column but uh, uh it's uh pretty easy in the rearview mirror to say they missed on this one um, refresh my memory mark what is bertelson um that's that's the interesting thing well sony Bertelson. almost sony almost disappeared from the planet dell did went pub uh went private and uh, Bertelsmann, I believe, was an information company out of Germany. Matt might know something about that, but I'm not even sure they still exist. And certainly none of them, I mean, Dell had quite a bit of success, but that even waned. 
at uh, at some he point. He has three great examples here, then, doesn't he? Okay. Yeah. And then I took I took the headlines across the top. You know, we're all. I was accused of this at the last uh, stock panel session of being one of those clocks that's only right twice a day. Um, you know, and Abelson, Abelson was great. One of my favorite writers of all time. But, you know, when you make these calls on the market, I, I just find it amazing because, you know, here we were back in May 1999 and people thought the world was going to end come December and there were all kinds of things going on. And you look at the graph on the right, here's the value line arithmetic average. You really can't see much going on here. But three years later, you got a moment that was a recessionary moment. And of course, with uh, the great uh, recession, 10 years later, you had a really ugly moment, but it certainly didn't happen anytime soon. Carl Icahn is renowned for it also. And uh, I just find it kind of fascinating. Uh, the graph in the middle, obviously, some of the individual companies, it didn't happen right away. Again, there's quite a time frame there from the time that that uh, magazine cover came out to uh, a pretty nasty downdraft here with what did happen. But, boy, that long-term track record, hmm, kind of kind of tough to, to, to see that uh, working out. I just want to point out that, you know, when you see this type of absolutism and and – nasty stuff or extremely positive stuff uh, back in this same time frame there was an article within weeks of this one about how enron was god's gift to investing and uh, <laughs> the chief financial officer was featured on the cover of cfo magazine you know back in this time frame so uh, again anytime you see something that absolute uh scratch your head smile and go shopping for good companies, better companies, or excellent companies at good prices. And then, Ken, I think you'll get a kick out of this one. Lockheed looks poised for liftoff. Um, that's not a very good liftoff back at that time frame. And if you look closely, um, they were on the runway for about 10 years, according to the stock price chart. So, again, just... I. Sometimes I think it's interesting to look in the rearview mirror and what it, I think what we can be thankful for and what we can take away from things like this is don't, don't put too much stock, no pun intended, too much stock in one of these. Well, and, and Mark, uh, I, I think that I would have characterized Amazon during that period from the beginning of the graph out to, Oh, out maybe nine or 10 years, because that's how long it took it to recover, uh, for, if I'm reading that graph correctly. Um, I think it's important to, to ask yourself sometimes when you're looking at, at brand new ideas, uh, are you buying the, the idea? And you know, to go back to that graphic we use, is it price to hope? Uh, or is it price to anything that you can actually measure? And Amazon was was pretty difficult to deal with during that particular time period with Bezos making all kinds of claims about, uh, you know, I can make a profit whenever I want to make a profit. Uh, and with the indecision, at least on my part, as to what the final business model for this company was going to be. I mean, we went from it being nothing more than a bookseller uh, to taking over the world and everything in between. I think we're settling down now into a much more rational model of what Amazon is and what it can become. Um, but it certainly isn't going to reach those places without competition. And I think maybe 20 years ago, we were thinking that Amazon was going to lift off without a care in the world and without a competitor in sight. I, I agree completely. We we touched on this in fairly great detail back in those days, talking about things to be thankful for over the last year. Uh, the the pandemic actually gave us Hugh McManus for uh, many more sessions. And one of the things we talked about was Amazon and Tesla and perceptions and all that kind of stuff. Uh, he, Hugh actually threw water on the, the falseness, the myth that uh, – Tesla is a car company because it's not. And same thing here. Uh, Hugh actually selected Amazon for the roundtable back in the, I believe, 2011, 2012 timeframe. And it's it's done spectacularly well. But that would have been after that period that you're talking about, Ken. 
Yeah, uh, Matt is answering a few questions that I had when I read this here, Mark. Uh, a Bertelsmann Music Group is the complete name of the uh, uh, company that we're looking at right here. And uh, it owns Penguin and Random House. And those are certainly names that if you're a reader, you're familiar mm -hmm. with. And then Matt makes a great point where he says, you know, it makes a lot of sense in the 1990s when Amazon was considered a bookseller that they would choose a company like Sony uh, and a company like Bertelsmann to to talk about competitors, to talk about competition, uh, you know, in the same general kinds of space, uh, but featuring uh, their own material rather than somebody else's material. Interesting. Okay, well, now we know. I'm not even sure why I know Penguin and Random House are still around. I wonder what's what remains of uh, the other portions of Bertelsmann. Here's a closer look at that chart. And this, this is what just to reinforce what Ken was talking about. Back in this time frame, it was pretty tough to get a handle on the business model. And then during this period in time, my per personal opinion slash professional opinion is that uh, he spent most of that time antagonizing the Wall Street rhinos at all of the dog and pony shows. So it was difficult to get a handle on this company, but they have put together quite a formidable business model over time. Quite a flat spot here over the last several months, though, that uh, a number of people have picked up on. And uh, if you believe that Amazon is going to continue on the path that they've been on, uh, it is approaching a situation where it could become a an opportunity again. You can see that the numbers are getting a little bit low over here again, too, on the relative strength. All right, Ken, I had a little bit of fun with this one. Uh, Charlie Blillo from uh, the Ritholtz gang in the compound put together this chart, which I, I have a hard time wrapping myself around this one, with the NASDAQ near all-time highs and the index itself basically at or near those all-time highs, you've got all this going on bubbling underneath, you know, underneath the Apples and Amazons and Microsofts and et cetera that are holding up that uh, big old average. And then you've got these other companies that are just getting crucified right now. And uh, my first reaction to this is some of these are companies that are going to persist and, and succeed. And uh, there's got to be an opportunity or two on this list. What are your thoughts? Well, I'm struck, Mark, by this list on the left here about how many of these companies uh, become the topic du jour uh, by the talking heads, whether you're looking, whether you're watching Barron's on TV or CNBC or, or Fox Business. Uh, you know, they, they seem to pick up on three or four companies and and just get almost manic about it. And then uh, they kind of fade away. You don't hear much about them at all. When's the last time you really heard people discussing Beyond Meat, uh, for example? You know, uh, uh, they they seem to be all taken up with Zoom at the moment. Maybe it's because Zoom just reported uh, some earnings and everything. But uh, this looks to me like a, a list of companies that that are just way out over their skis to the point that uh, maybe patience and discipline would be a wonderful thing for you to deal with as far as these companies are concerned. Uh, a good old-fashioned uh, business model analysis might indicate that there's uh, not a whole lot of potential uh, in a lot of these companies at the moment. Yeah, and that's... that's well, the... I can... Go ahead, Kim. I can tell you that one of those stocks in there, Wix, W-I-X, I do believe that um, the guy who ran Morningstar and then he left, Dorsey, I believe he backed up to truck to that stock within the last quarter. Yeah, that's good. I'm trying to see if I, I'm trying to look up uh, Datarama to see if I can find that and see how much I think he, he like increased his position 40%. Okay. Yeah, some of these are, are, you know, I think some of these have the potential of falling into the the overreaction trap for sure. I mean, actually, opportunity. 
you know, one that kind of jumped off the page at me, Ken, was Stone Co. That this is a company that two years ago now, Pat Donnelly presented at the at one of our successful investing conferences. And the company, I believe, still continues to fire on at least six, if not eight cylinders. And uh, kind of hard to follow, you know, what's going on with that price correction. And uh, could be some potential opportunity there. So I do believe some of these companies, uh, it kind of mystifies me with gambling and uh, some of the gaming stuff that's really uh, taken off a little bit. Again, in a bad economy and less disposable income, I suppose there'd be some impact. But, you know, DraftKings and these gambling-related companies. You're, you're reading my mind, Mark. Do you, do you think the gamification of, of stock trading has contributed to these kind of companies in the market? And this kind of, uh, of loss from all-time highs in a market where the indexes are hitting all-time highs. Yeah, it's 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 kind of a tough question, but I, I don't think gambling is going away anytime soon. And uh, you know, DraftKings at a fifty percent price drop, depending on the, again the business model and the fundamental analysis behind it. Um, Kathy Wood it was out pretty strong for Teladoc this weekend. Um, so I, I do think that there's some opportunities on here. And to that effect, on the right hand side, I just I'm reminded of that moment in time uh, last March when uh, we basically talked about a bunch of companies that have a low relative strength index. What that means is their stock price has been punished to the point it's deemed by a mathematical definition to be oversold. And there are potential opportunities when companies have a, a huge a drop in relative strength index, RSI, and there are, there's a little bit of crossover here. Um, again, I am pushed into at least scratching my head very carefully over Pat Donnelly's interest in this company. Warren Buffett owns it too. So Pat Donnelly and Warren Buffett own it. That's a pretty powerful signal. And uh, there, there's got there's got to be some interesting companies on here. I'm a little bit interested in this one here. I don't know much about it, but NVTA, Invite. Well, there's... Mark, uh, when we were looking at Illumina, uh, when we first began looking at Illumina, uh, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago, another biotech that, that it came up in the discussion with a, uh, a really great story behind it was this Organovo. Uh, these folks are, are trying to find ways to print uh, human parts. Uh, you heard that correctly. They're finding, trying to find ways to use a 3D printer to print parts for a human body. Uh, so uh, its price has certainly taken a beating. Mark, what I find difficult to, to, to reconcile in my own mind is why every single company on this low RSI list isn't sitting on this uh, percentage below all time closing high list. Uh, maybe it just means that some of them never got that high uh, and their sell-off uh, is not quite as dramatic. Uh, but I, I would think that if you have a low relative strength, then you, you probably are, are pretty much off your all-time high. I just wonder why there's not more crossover between the two lists. Yeah, Char Charlie's probably got a cap limit on there of some kind. Some of the yeah. companies on the right are a lot smaller. Oh, well, I did find that um, in the third quarter, Pat Dorsey from Dorsey Asset Management, who, who worked at Morningstar and did all that, um, he increased his position 34% on WIX, increased PayPal 3.6%, and he bought a new company, which I've never heard of, SEMR, Smurush Holdings. That'll be one I'll have to look up. Hmm, interesting. Then he has a extremely concentrated portfolio of only nine stocks, and he's got a billion dollars in assets under management. Yeah, we'll have to take a closer look at Data Roma next next week or the week after, because uh, it again can be a source of ideas to kick around. I just think there's a lot of interesting ideas on here. If anybody out there 
does some deep, a deeper dive on any of these, please feel free to post on the forum if you find something particularly compelling. Um, well, Mark, uh, I I'm, I just pulled out a list that I had made for our uh, uh, one of our classes on the the successful investing series, uh, where I had come up with a a list of a dozen or so stocks that I found compelling. And the only name that I can find on both these lists that's on my compelling list is this CRSP stock, right. this CRISPR Therapeutics. Uh, I really think that that one deserves a, 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 a second look only because I, I think that it's dealing with stuff that's going to revolutionize medicine. Uh, Matt is making the point uh, that CRISPR uh, carries a, a pretty decent amount of cash uh, on its books uh, for uh, what's been happening uh, with the stock. Uh, he says uh, uh, it's a $78 stock with about $32 uh, per share in cash. That's a, that's a very interesting statistic. Uh, yeah. And of course, it, that type of statistic is reflected in our projected return on value. By the way, I forgot to mention the one on the right is a sort of lowest relative strength index with the condition that the, the projected return on value be basically double digits. So that's how I screened it down to companies that uh, could be attractive. What Matt has just described, a high amount of cash in the wallet is actually quite favorable to some of these companies when it comes to that projected return on value. So, And that's actually shown right here. Some of these, and this, whoever this is, this Atea Pharmaceutical, AVIR, they're, they're another one of those companies that has a huge amount of cash on their balance sheet. And that's why that number is so high, because I thought it had to be a, a bogey. Just a, Well, it sounds like they could easily be an acquisition just because they have so much cash on the balance sheet. Yeah, they probably have to do something with it. And notice that our old friend is on here, Ken. <laughs> we just took out of the portfolio. I know. I know. And it's down to 23 now, so that probably cues us up for our next subject. Turkeys that bother us. No, it's not a turkey. I actually have a lot of faith for the company long term. They're just not following my instructions. Once again, my management team not listening to me. Um, I found it interesting that the fair, fair, fair value by Morningstar was cut in half on this company within the last few days. And it is now down to 23. Um, so once again, I have uh, brought a company to its knees. I'll tell you, Mark, this company is advertising like heck, um, at least on our local uh, TV stations. Uh, you know, Medicare uh, uh, closes for uh, changing in Medicare uh, within the next week and a half or so. And eHealth is offering a lot of different Medicare plans. They're just advertising all over the the channels right now. I'm surprised, uh, but I don't know. Is that uh, is that the wisest way to to reach uh, folks of of, an, of a certain number of years? Perhaps I'm not sure. Well, see, see, they're they're targeting you via CNBC. They they figure okay. they figure if you watch <laughs> CNBC, you could be sold to. Uh, perhaps. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. And we are making light of it, but um, eHealth was a, a selection that I had made that Ken yellow carded and tried to red card during the, the selection process. And sure enough, it uh, took them all of 10 days to drop more than 30% versus the market. So we walked away at approximately $30. It has continued to drop down to uh, $23. So at least for now, um, that's turning out to be a fairly decent situation because we replaced eHealth with Pacira, Pachira Biosciences, you know, in the portfolio. And Pachira has uh, sagged a little bit, but uh, not as much as eHealth has continued to sag. So this is the current uh, list of companies uh, doing pretty well. Got to, got to feel are, pretty good about those companies up at the top. Are we going to... Uh... Uh, show the original portfolio without the the changes yeah, uh, as we go forward then too, Mark? We keep that also, um, and we will be showing them, keeping track of Great. them. 
Great. Yep. Okay, just a quick moment here with Insider Monkey as a, a place for ideas. Kim had, had kicked around something. Uh, she likes to follow people who have a track record of demonstrated success in investing. And Insider Monkey is a this is a free site. You can sign up for a premium version of this, but if you go to insidermonkey.com uh, with leaving this stuff off, you can uh, access anything that I'm showing you here today. And uh, they, they basically keep track of uh, a variety of institutional slash rhinos. And uh, just as an example, Kim and I were kicking around a fairly decent track record for a firm, which I had not heard of, um, Adage Capital Management. And uh, Kim, can you provide some background on on this one? Well, one of the things I always like to do when I'm talking to other investors, where is your source of ideas? And I was talking to someone and I said, I came across this company, I mean, added capital management. <clears throat> you know, I've never heard of it. Have you heard of it? <clears throat> and I was told, oh yeah, whatever they're getting into, you need to take an idea. Uh, you know, you need to take a look at what they're buying because they kind of want to have a 30% return a year. And, you know, that just perks my ears up big time. So I have kind of kept it on my radar anytime I need to look for, for a stock that I need or something for the um, round table. And they do well. Like here it is that on average, they're uh, five or four and a half percent higher than the S&P index every year. So, you know, how do you complain with that? You don't. Yeah, and so it's a great is, way to get ideas. Go ahead, Kim. I said, it's just a great way to get ideas. And um, I was talking actually, for the life of me, it, it may have been my friend, Sean saying, have you ever heard of him? And he said, yeah, and he knew about it because he was in the investing circles. So it's always it's always a good thing to ask where are you getting your stock ideas? Have you found somebody else? What website? Because Insider Monkey is what um, Mark had told me about, and when we get a chance, we're going to talk about Data Roma because I found Data Roma, and that is for me that's a wealth of ideas. Mm -hmm. So all of, we all want to succeed in our investing, and so it's great to have that communication with each other to find out how can we succeed and do better. Yeah, and one of the things you can do at a site like this, and uh, here's an here's an example, you can actually dig into their latest 13G filings, which is what they're actually buying, and I'm talking about recently buying, and these guys are all over the SPAC market. They, these guys must be listening to Matt Spielman. Um, many of those on the list are are SPACs, and but as you go down the list, you can find a couple of companies there. GitLab being one that. Uh, I had looked at briefly while we were doing some small company stuff, but this is just an example of what are these guys actually interested in right now. And uh, for many of these companies that are on Insider Monkey, it would be a list of pretty traditional companies. This is my favorite place to go for Rock Springs Capital Management and Chris Jenner to watch what he is actually tracking and what they're Mark, I I have a question about the, the data source itself. It, uh, does the filing, the 13G filing, does it tell me whether they uh, are in as original money in these SPACs or whether they've bought the SPAC on the open market? Um, you can go straight to the filing and you know if you want to get more uh, deeper information about it, I do not know specifically the answer to your question, but you can pull up the actual SEC paperwork. Okay, so what I'm looking here is from which site again, Mark? This is insidermonkey.com. Okay, uh, and it's adage, A-D-A-G-E. Is, uh, is the name of the-, the Capital actual, management. That's yeah. the rhinos okay. that we were actually tracking down. Okay, uh, there, I just, I guess I, I'm, just trying to alert uh, folks that there's two different ways you can invest in a SPAC. Uh, you might be part of the original pool of money that they pull together uh, to create the opportunity to buy some company. Uh, and they have two years to get that opportunity out there uh, and to make it happen. Uh, if the opportunity doesn't come and they don't buy a company that they can transfer 
uh, their assets to, then the money goes back to whoever uh, put it in in the first place. Uh, but you can also buy these SPACs uh, uh, on the open market once they start trading. They start trading at $10, and the closer they get to a deal, the more that the price tends to move upward. So uh, maybe we should be uh, talking a little bit about this whole SPAC universe if we're going to put a list like this out there at some point going forward, Mark. Yeah, I, I was a little bit surprised to see it, and that's the reason that I, I brought bring it to the attention. You know that that these investors that have a decent track record are at least pursuing this. And I know Matt has had some experience with Sophie and uh, uh, Luminar and that kind of stuff, uh, investing in them via the SPAC route. All right, just a couple minutes to to refresh. We are in response to some of the stuff you guys have asked for. Uh, supporting an, an investable option for the best small companies for this year through M1 Finance. That's a brokerage firm out of Chicago. They're small. They're much like a, a Robin Hood, only not a trading Robin Hood, an investing Robin Hood. What do I mean by that? You can actually go to m1finance.com and uh, get a little more information. But, again, we have shared this here for the last several weeks. Just want to make the point. It's not for trading. They do not support traditional mutual funds, for example. They are completely on ETFs, so stocks and ETFs, uh, zero transaction fee. The reason we are here is we went searching for a place where people could invest directly into a, basically a model portfolio, our best small company portfolio of 20 uh, promising small companies for the next year. We go up from Halloween to Halloween, and... Uh, M1 was a, a place that offered a pretty decent uh, doorway or portal to doing that. So you can do your own homework on this one. Uh, I'm still learning my way through a lot of the stuff. We will probably have a detailed uh, video out on this here fairly soon. You can actually access the pie. They call it their baskets of stocks. They refer to as pies. I kind of thought that rhymed with Thanksgiving also. In fact, that when we're done here, I'm going to go out and try to find a pumpkin pie for my bride as we celebrate that event. But uh, they call them pies. So the 20 small companies that are in this year's list are actually in a portfolio, which you can access at this link. If you actually use this link to establish a real money portfolio, we do receive an incentive bonus, and so do you. Um, so that's just full disclosure. And uh, you can go there and figure out, uh, you can actually access the 20 holdings in this portfolio. This is going to be actively managed. As you heard just a few slides ago, we uh, removed eHealth and replaced it with Pachira Biosciences just a few days ago. And we do keep track of, uh, you know, key performance and basically disclose everything that we do. Mark, I have a technical question. Okay, so... Let's say that uh, six months from now, uh, no, let's, let, let's not say six months. Let's say a year and a day from now, uh, I want to sell this, okay? Um, if there are profits, uh, 19 of the companies I've owned for long term, but one of the companies, because we sold one and added a new one, one of the companies, if it has a gain, will be a short-term gain. Will that be broken out? Uh, in the paperwork that would come from the sale? Well, I'm sure that it will be. Uh, the, the, the transaction that we have so far is actually a short-term capital loss. Well, but I'm, I'm just asking a what if. So, mm -hmm. so the, the paperwork, uh, when it comes to the investor, uh, doesn't speak about a pie, doesn't speak about a basket. It, it would speak about 20 individual stocks or maybe 21 individual stocks uh, because we we had eHealth in the pie, then it was sold, and now it's been replaced by Pacera. So uh, is that the way that the the accounting would look at the if we were to sell it? Yeah, you're in the end of year brokerage statement, you would be receiving right. that transaction for sure. Yeah, and, and I don't know if you were on when Matt and I were talking earlier. Uh, you, you know what what happens a year from now? What happens next Halloween as we think about this list, and uh, we basically try to rebalance and turn it into our twenty fresh new companies. 
we we do have to think through exactly what that looks like. And as I described for Matt, our track record has been that we do hang on to anywhere from eight to ten from the preceding year on average. So the, I I would be surprised if that didn't continue in some fashion. But we do also want to come up with a, a method of you know rolling out the companies, rolling in the new companies that uh, that makes sense. But we'd also want to make sure that if we roll companies out, uh, we held them long enough to make a long-term gain in them, right, rather than a short-term gain? Yeah, as, as Matt and I discussed, we're probably looking at uh, at least one year plus one day situation. Okay. To, to, All right. to respect uh, it, that. It, I think that, that uh, at some point uh, during the bull session, when it gets closer to the time that, that the year turns over, and that's, uh, you know, uh, November 1st, uh, I think that we have to to show some examples of of what the accounting looks like, so that uh, the people that have put money into the pie uh, are a little bit comfortable with what's going to be happening as uh, as the the pie changes, or whether or not this pie stays the same and a new pie is created. I'm right. I'm not sure which, you know. And then also keep in mind that you have control over your personal pie. Yeah. So you you can actually change companies, that type of stuff. So a couple people wrote to us and said, Mark, I'm not buying your Chinese hotel company. Um, so they replaced it with something else. So they, they drifted. It'll be interesting to see what type of stories uh, propagate or percolate from, from those type of things also. But yeah, the, okay. so, the individual yeah. investor still has control over everything. The only thing that's different is it really is uh, you're, we're basically giving you the seed, you know, five percent each of twenty companies, and uh, take it from there, following along with us. Okay. There will be people out there that will that will decide not to sell, and uh, again, we'll we'll have more discussions about that also. Uh, we don't have any real data. Uh, to show how our lists do into the second or third or fourth year of existence, do we? Other than we did retain the dashboards that probably need to be uh, updated and split adjusted and that kind of stuff. Right, but that would be a, a quite a bit of uh, of effort to make that happen. Yeah, yeah. I, I suppose we could do something along those lines. The one thing I would point out is companies like Forward Air. I think we're on the list for at least six straight years. So we've got things like that to, yeah. to look back on. So yeah, there's 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 some mechanics here involved and we'll we're all learning together, but I'll I'll tell you, I frankly I am excited and this is I'm obviously biased, but I'm also excited to be able to invest in a true small company investable opportunity. Oh, it. I don't have any any uh, lack of enthusiasm for what we're doing. Uh, I just uh, have a lot of mechanical issues, uh, primarily because whatever would happen if I put money into something like this, I have to be able to explain to my wife who keeps all of our records. Mm -hmm. And I don't I, I want to be able to explain it in as clear a way as possible so that our records uh, stay very clear. Uh, it'd be interesting to see what a brokerage statement from one of these pies looks like at the end of the year. Uh, maybe that'll be something we'll be able to share with our audience. We'll definitely be able to share something uh, at the end of the month and, and show the the statements as we go. Okay, great. So it should be fun. All right, I am showing three o'clock, so we're not going to go too much into this. Just a quick reminder that we do like to feature a company which has um, fits somewhere onto the second or third slice of this graphic. Um, I'm in love with this slide because, again, the moral of this entire story is that we're talking about things which be, could be construed as theory that are more than theory. Um, when you look at real life examples, as we did last week with Under Armour, you see that it's not just a theory that you have these kind of stages as you as you get into this type of investment analysis. And this week, just for kicks, I very quickly, and I'm just going to leave it to the audience for homework, very quickly took a look at a fairly hot company. This is uh, one of the leading performers in the roundtable, thanks to Herb Lemkul. 
Um, he's got a pretty good shot at being in the in the trophy ceremony in February with that pick alone. And uh, this is what the sales trajectory looks like for NVIDIA going back to 2009. Um, I have a theory that uh, value line could be right, but I think they might be low on their three to five year forecast based on uh, the general trends that we see there. Again, this one's going to go up and down a little bit. We know that. Here's a longer term look at the company. You can see that it's made fairly steady progress. I'm a bit fascinated by the fact that the business model seemed to be generating fairly consistent results. And there's a pretty noticeable multi-year plateau in the middle of that chart. As this company was uh, rather consistently, fairly dramatically, building a business. Followed by this one, steadily improving profitability, the stuff that Herb talked about in his roundtable presentation. And again, I just find myself scratching my head over these elevated numbers during that plateau a few years ago when the stock price was down in single digits. And it's something that we, we will continue to talk about and explore even more carefully. This says draft because I just simply haven't didn't have time to go back and uh, audit and scrutinize the numbers completely. But I, I find it compelling that once again, we're talking about a fairly early stage company and uh, potential opportunity that could be flagged by some of the stuff that we look at all the time around here. Any thoughts, Ken? Uh, nothing except that uh, I, I thank my, at that time, about 12 or 13 year old grandson for the idea of NVIDIA. He's an avid gamer and uh, those chips were being used in some of his games and he brought it to our family investment club and uh, it's just been a great, great stock to hold. It's probably paid for half of Ethan's college. So uh, it, you can, if you get somebody that, that's really sold on a product sometimes, you can listen very carefully and then do your analysis. And, and again, early stage investing isn't bad. It's just a different kind of investing. And, and better investing, Nick, Mr. Nicholson never said, you shouldn't be looking at companies like this. He just suggested that it wasn't for the the inexperienced. It was for people that had a rough idea of what they were doing and already had built a portfolio of the good solid up straight and parallel kind of stocks. Yeah, and my, my thoughts go back to a, a story of regret. I spent an evening with David Gardner and his family um, back in that same time frame, probably somewhere right around here. We were in... Uh, Washington, D.C. for one of the national conventions, Ken, so we could actually date stamp it with that. And uh, he made a pretty strong case for NVIDIA, and I didn't listen very well. I am, I'm learning to listen a little bit better. All right, so we'll come back and even go a little bit deeper on that one, but uh, have some good, clean fun. Um, here are the, uh, the accessible sessions for the successful investing conferences that are on YouTube under the Manifest Investing channel. We put all of the bull sessions and the roundtables there also, but you can actually go back and, and check back in on uh, the panel sessions and some of the content sessions. A number of people have written to me. They want to better understand this projected return on value, and I've been pushing them to this presentation from November 2020, a little over a year ago, that uh, describes that entire concept and uh, topic. Things to be thankful for. We're a week out from the roundtable next Tuesday at 8.30 p.m. Hugh has assured me that he's going to be there, so we'll have a bit of an Irish flair to our Thanksgiving edition, and uh, I think we can continue to be thankful for this. Here's a statistic that I think you'll enjoy, Ken and Kim. For the active, that means the non-closed, non-sold positions in the round table going back to since inception, the average annualized total return for those selections is 22.8%. I'm willing to be thankful for that. I think we all should be thankful for that. It, it points out, Mark, that the difficulty of beating the market by a, a set amount when the market's doing as uh, 
uh, boy, I hate to say how fantastic it's doing, but it's doing pretty fantastic. When the market's uh, hitting the kind of percentage growth that it's been hitting uh, recently, it it points out that that uh, beating it by three or four or five points uh, is difficult but doable. And uh, all I want to do is see that begin to move back towards that dotted red line. Uh, and I think if the market tends to cool off, uh, our experience has been that uh, we tend to do better versus the market uh, when it's uh, cooling. We we tend to to have a little bit more traction uh, when the market is cooling down than when it's heating up. And and Ken, you know what makes me sad? What Mark? That this blind squirrel hasn't found a, a good one here in the last few months lately. And uh, I just got to believe that my blind squirrel approach is gonna is gonna be uh, rewarded at some point if I'm patient and disciplined. Well, you're a, you're a pretty decent stock picker. <laughs> <laughs> just been a little erratic recently. That's all. <laughs> I, I'm confident that I just need a little more time. Silence is time. And with that, unless you guys have anything else, I'll just leave us with this. Thanksgiving moment that we have shared in the past at Manifest Investing and from the author of Old Little Town of Bethlehem a little bit of a moment of Thanksgiving and gratitude that I think we all share. I certainly share it and I think of you guys all uh, with fondness in my heart and for the things we've been able to accomplish together I look forward to uh, what the future might hold. And with Thank that, you for every day. Yeah. Any closing thoughts, Ken? No, just I'm I'm thankful for for all that you do for investors, Mark. I'm thankful, Kim, for your ability to join with us uh, on a weekly basis, and I'm thankful that we've been able to do these programs for as long as we've been able to do them, and still attract a decent audience. It uh, it it goes out to our audience that without you being there. Uh, we'd be talking to ourselves, and while we do that sometimes, it's a <laughs> lot nicer to talk to a group. Oh, we do it a lot more, though, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> talk to ourselves? You betcha. All right. Well, happy we get the Thanksgiving. answer we want. That's the dangerous part. <laughs> well, happy Thanksgiving out there to everybody. And again, back to that slide of the tsunami of opportunities. If anybody sees anything uh, particularly compelling, in that list of oversold stocks and the stocks that have been absolutely crushed. Um, please feel free to share. And uh, we, again, we appreciate all of you. Thank you. Mark, if we can stick around for just a couple of questions after you close down, I'd appreciate it. All right, we'll shut down. Thanks everybody.